So in this chapter, we're into special senses. So we usually include special senses right after we talk about your nervous system because senses include the ability to perceive stimuli. So your nervous system is involved, but these are kind of some of your special sense organs. Um, the idea of sensation is the conscious awareness of stimuli received by all your sensory neurons. And sensation can be hearing, it can be sight, it can be smell. I think in grade school, you learned about those five senses. Um, so that's what we're gonna be going over today. Sensory receptors are the sensory nerve endings that respond to all stimuli by developing an action potential. So here are the senses. You have general senses located in your skin, muscles, and joints, and we call those somatic general senses that help you to detect touch, pressure. Proprioception is the ability of your joints um, or body parts or muscles to understand where they are in relationship to something else. So that's, that's the idea that your two elbows, for example, they, you, you won't, they won't like hit each other. That's the idea that your body parts know where they are in relation to each other. That's what proprioception means. And then temperature and pain, and then your visceral general senses. Remember, viscera has to do with organs. So these are senses detecting pain and pressure in your internal organs. And then your special senses are located within specific organs like your eyes or your ear. And here we have smell, taste, sight, hearing, and balance that we'll go over today. So general senses, um, these are over a large part of the body that sense your touch, pressure, pain, temperature, even itching. Somatic provide information about the body and the environment and visceral provide information about your viscera, your internal organs, and then here are your special senses that we'll go over today. We define the types of sensory receptors. Um, we group them based on what they detect. So mechanoreceptors detect movement, think mechanical movement. And an example of mechanical receptors are touch, pressure, and vibration. Chemoreceptors detect um, chemicals. So this would be an example of chemoreceptors would be found in your nose, or, so they detect odors. And then photoreceptors detect light, and you have those in the back of your eye in the retina. Thermoreceptors detect temperature changes, and nociceptors detect pain. Um, specific types of touch receptors usually found in your skin. The Merkel's disc detects light touch and pressure. The hair follicle receptors detect light touch, and then the Meisner corpuscles are deeper into the epidermis. They help to localize tactile um, or kind of vibration sensation. And these types of receptors are probably named for the people who discovered them. So the guy named Merkel, a guy named Meisner discovered those types of receptors. Ruffini corpuscles are deep tactile receptors. They detect continuous pressure in the skin. Pacinian corpuscles are the deepest. Um, these are the ones that also to help detect pressure, vibration, position. They're associated with tendons and joints. Again, the, the silly names are probably names of people who um, discovered them. And I don't think you have any specific questions about those specific types of receptors in your um, exam coming up. So here's a look at skin. Um, we've looked at the integumentary system already. And then these are some of the specific types of sensory receptors in the skin. We have free nerve endings detecting painful stimuli, itch, temperature, hair follicle receptors, Merkel discs are more superficial, Meisner's are more superficial, and then we have Ruffini and Pacinian corpuscles that are deeper into um, the dermis layer of the skin. The Pacinian corpuscle, I always think this was a fun one to learn because it kind of looks like a lollipop. The, it's a skin receptor um, that has layers that look like a lollipop in it if that helps you remember that one. Thank you, Robert, for sending me that DM. You should have sent it to everyone. Two physiologists won a Nobel Prize this year dealing with how we feel temperature and touch. Thanks for letting me know, Robert. That's really interesting. I'm going to look that up. Thank you. So pain is an unpleasant, as we all know, perceptual and emotional experience um, that is very important that our body can detect pain. Pain can be localized or diffuse. Localized is more of the sharp, prickling, cutting pain. Um, so it'll have rapid action potentials. 
And diffuse pain is more of the dull, burning, aching pain, and it will have slower action potentials. And we as people respond, you know, um, differently to pain. And some of us have a high pain tolerance and a low pain tolerance, and that does exist. Some people can't handle a lot of pain, others can. Um, pain is very important because it tells our body that something wrong. People who don't have pain or sensory receptors, for example, burn victims um, who got a lot of, you know, think of third degree burns that went all the way through the dermis, all of their sensory receptors have been burned off and they cannot feel pain anymore, um, which is very dangerous. But we have ways to control pain if you're going under surgery or giving birth, which I'm a big fan of. Um, we have local anesthesia and general anesthesia. Local anesthesia, um, the action potentials are suppressed from pain. And this is just, it, these are receptors in just a local area. So chemicals are injected near a sensory nerve. So for example, if you're having dental work done, they'll inject chemicals, local anesthesia, right in the mandibular foramen where you'll have a sensory nerve. Um, so they'll try to localize um, that pain control. General anesthesia is loss of consciousness. These are chemicals that affect the reticular formation, so more in the brain. So when someone goes completely under, like my daughter had to go under when they removed her pin that was about this long. I think I was going to try to show you guys that. She's so proud of it. She came through that just fine. Um, it's not good to go through general anesthesia often. So it's very helpful in terms of surgery, but you don't want to be going under, um, you know, every other day. So it's not something you want to go under all the time. Uh, referred pain is very interesting because it originates in a region that is not the source of pain stimulus. And I can't remember if we talked about this in the nervous system. Um, referred pain is felt when internal organs are damaged or inflamed and sensory neurons from the superficial area near the skin and neurons of the source of pain converge onto the same ascending neurons on the spinal cord. So for example, what's happening in referred pain is sensory neurons that are, let's say, coming from the left side of the arm are converging with the same sensory neuron that's coming from the internal organ of the heart. So let's say someone is having a heart attack, um, that pain might be referred or deferred to their left side of their arm because those sensory receptors follow the same pathway uh, to the brain. So these are areas of referred pain. So if you come across someone, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are, um, I think a lot of you are EMTs or studying the emer emergency medical services, you guys know that if you come across someone, it feels like an elephant's on their chest and they have pain on their left arm, that's usually a sign of a heart attack. But other areas of referred pain, you know, appendix, someone with appendicitis often complains of pain right where their appendix is, but sometimes it can kind of be referred a little bit to the umbilical region. The colon is around the umbilical region. I mean, some of the areas are close to where the organ is located, but for example, the liver and gallbladder, someone might have pain in their upper right shoulder, um, but it might be referred to the gallbladder. And I got your message, Andrew. I think that'll be fine. I just haven't, I'm going to take some time to read it after. Olfaction is the sense of smell. It occurs in response to odorants. The receptors for olfaction are located in the nasal cavity and hard palate, and we can detect over 10,000 different smell types. The olfaction process, so your nasal cavity contains a very thin film of mucus where odors are dissolved, and then those olfactory neurons pick up those chemicals um, that are dissolved from the odors. Dendrites, so little nerve endings of those olfactory neurons are enlarged and contain cilia, the dendrites pick up odor, they depolarize, meaning action potentials travel through them, and they carry those odors to the axons in the olfactory bulb. And your frontal and the temporal lobes of your brain are the parts that process odor. So here's a look at olfactory epithelium. We have the olfactory bulb from the olfactory nerve, that's cranial nerve number one. Here, here are the olfactory nerve endings, kind of ending in their axons. These olfactory epithelium show you the sensory kind of neurons that are going to pick up the odors or the chemicals with their cilia in the mucus layer. So those odors get dissolved in that mucus layer. And then basically the nerve endings from that olfactory cranial nerve number one will pick up those chemicals and those chemicals change into action potentials that get sent to the brain. 
Taste is the sensory structures or taste buds are the sensory structures that detect taste. If you've been through COVID, you know that sometimes you might lo lose your taste. Um, yes, Richard, amputated amputees who lose, yes, referred pain can really bother amputees because, um, you know, if you, you might have heard of amputated am or amputees who've lost a limb, they still feel that the limb is there because um, the, the, sense, the sense of their limb being there or pain from the amputation will be traveling in the same sensory neurons as let's say a part of the skin, sensory neurons from the skin. Um, there's a word for that, referred pain. I, I don't know if there's, it's called phantom pain, but yes. And Cameron, you know of someone who can't smell not because of COVID, that's a bummer too. Um, I'm just gonna read through one more message, Andrew. I'm gonna try to get your message here. Thanks for pa your patience with me, guys. Yeah, you can take your test early during lap, Andrew, that's fine, yeah. Okay, so if you have been through COVID and lost your taste, no one really knows why yet, but it's very interesting. I don't know, my friend just lost her taste because of COVID and it sounded awful. But anyway, taste buds are located on a papilla of the tongue. And papilla are the bumps on your tongue. So some people think the bumps on your tongue are the taste buds themselves. The bumps on your tongue are the papilla and the taste buds are located on the papilla or within the grooves between the papilla they're also located on the hard palate and the throat. Inside each taste bud, there are 40 taste cells, and each taste cell has taste hairs that extend into taste pores. Um, so here, if we kind of zoom in on a papilla, you can see the bump is the papilla. And if we zoom in on kind of the side of the papilla, here we see the taste cell, the taste hair, and so forth. Here is the taste process, and I'm going to throw right out there, you know, your next exam um, on chapter nine, I think it includes this chapter, there aren't a whole lot of questions um, from chapter nine on your next exam. So I'm going to try to give you a couple hints here as we go through this, but there are a ton of questions from chapter nine. Most of your questions on the next exam, the lecture exam, are going to be talking about muscles um, and the nervous system, and I'll give you some hints when we're done here. So here's the taste process. Your taste buds pick up taste and send it to taste cells. Your taste cells send that taste to taste hairs, and then the taste hairs are what will contain the receptors that initiate action potentials, which are then carried to the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe is on the side of your brain, and that helps you to process taste. Here are the different types of taste. We have sweet, sour, salty, bitter, Umami is a taste that's from the breakdown of proteins from the amino acids in protein. I'm not really sure how to describe that taste, but it's coming from the breakdown of amino acids. And certain taste buds are more sensitive to certain tastes and that can change throughout your life as well. Taste is also linked to smell. So if you've ever gone wine testing, you guys in Southern California have tons of great wineries there. Um, you know, you, they often tell you to smell it first and then to taste it because they're very closely linked. So here's the pathway for the sense of taste traveling through um, some of the cranial nerves up to the taste area of the cortex in the parietal lobe. Again, knowing specifics about this, um, not important, but you can kind of just see how taste travels through the cranial nerves and then up to the brain to be um, interpreted. Your vision then. So vision, uh, we'll go through accessory structures first, eyebrows, eyelids, eyelashes. Basically, they just, all your accessory structures around the eye keep things from getting into the eye. So sweat and shade from the sun for your eyebrows. Eyelids and eyelashes protects from foreign objects so they can blink very quickly. And the blinking also helps to lubricate the eye to keep the eye very clean, there are enzymes in the tears in your eyes to help keep your eyes clean, which is very important. So here are the eye and the accessory structures. Um, the black dot in the middle is your pupil. And then the iris is the colored part of the eye. The iris contains smooth muscle that will control pupil dilation, so getting larger, and pupil constriction, getting smaller, the medial and lateral angle, and then the lower eyelid. Conjunctiva is a very thin membrane that covers the inner surface of the eyelid. So your eyelid, you kind of pull it up and look, it has a very kind of pinkish wet membrane. That's your conjunctiva. 
The lacrimal apparatus produces tears and the extrinsic eye muscles help to move the eyeball. Here's the lacrimal gland structures. The lacrimal gland is on the lateral upper side of the eye. It produces the tears. And then the tears flow across the eye, kind of lateral to medial, um, to wash over the eye, to keep it clean. It has an enzyme in, it, in, it, in the tears to wipe, um, to wipe off infection. Um, and then those tears will drain through these lacrimal canaliculi into the lacrimal sac and down into the nasolacrimal duct. Usually we cannot sense the tears that come into the nasolacrimal duct because there aren't many. So our nose will just you know, get rid of that moisture. But if we are crying a lot um, and our lacrimal gland is producing more tears, we usually need a tissue because those excess tears are coming out of our nose. Uh, extrinsic eye muscles, you have six of them all located on different parts of the eye and they're all named for where they're located, superior, lateral, inferior, um, superior oblique and inferior oblique and they all move the eyeball in a million different ways. So those are your extrinsic eye muscles. And then here we get into the anatomy of the eye. It's a hollow fluid filled sphere composed of three layers or tunics and we divide it into chambers. Um, if we look here, um, here, if we look into the anterior and posterior chamber, um, those refer to the chambers in front of the lens. So I'm going to kind of circle the lens for you. The lens is kind of this biconcave um, structure that light will shine through. But in front of the lens, we have an anterior and a posterior chamber. The anterior chamber will be the part in front of the pupil and iris. And the posterior chamber is right behind the pupil, but in front of the lens. Both are filled with what we call aqueous humor, which is a more like liquid fluid. Um, so those are the anterior and posterior chambers with the pupil and the lens. Um, and then the iris, again, is the colored part of the eye that surrounds the pupil that controls the shape of it. Uh, then we get to three different tunics or layers. The fibrous tunic is the outermost tunic. And it consists of the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, and the cornea. And the cornea is this part that kind of covers the iris and the pupil. It's where you would put a contact lens. The second layer of the eye is the vascular tunic. And we call it vascular because this is where we'll have our blood vessels. And the vascular tunic is made up of the ciliary body and the choroid layer. The ciliary body is kind of this kind of, it's also called the ciliary muscle. You can see it on the top and bottom here. It's this pink muscle and it contains what we call little white suspensory ligaments. And those are labeled here. And those control the shape of the lens to help with near and far-sighted vision. And then the retina is the third layer of the eye. This is the nervous tunic. That means this is where your nerves are located. Um, if we look at kind of the aqueous humor is in the anterior and posterior chamber in front of the lens, the vitreous chamber is behind the lens and it's filled with vitreous humor, um, which is kind of shown here. It's more of like a jelly-like substance to give the eyeball its shape. So that's the eye. You can see the optic nerve attached to the back of the eye here. And we'll go over to those into that into a little more detail now. So the fibrous Tunic is the outermost tunic. We have the sclera, the firm white outer part that helps to maintain the eye shape, provides attachment sites and protects internal structures. And then the cornea is the transparent structure that covers the iris and pupil. It allows the light to enter and focuses the light. The middle tunic is the vascular tunic. It contains your blood supply. Choroid will be the black part that contains melanin, which will deliver oxygen and nutrients to the retina. The ciliary body with the suspensory ligaments help to hold that lens in place. The lens is the flexible disc that can change shape to focus light onto the retina, which is the back part of the eye. The iris is the colored part. It will surround and regulate the pupil size. The pupil then regulates the amount of light entering. So if you have lots of light and it's a, you're in a really bright room or you're outside, your pupils become constricted to try to keep out all that light. And if you're in a dark room or at nighttime, your pupils become dilated to try to take in as much light as they can to see. 
So this is what happens if you've been drinking and you get pulled over. Um, normally this is at night, I guess sometimes not, but your eyes are dilated because it's dark. And the first thing the police officer will do is shine a flashlight into your eyes to see if they constrict. Alcohol will affect the nervous system ability for your pupils to constrict. So shining the light in someone's eye who's been drinking, um, their eyes might stay dilated and they won't constrict with that um, flashlight. So it's an easy way to tell if someone's nervous system is off due to alcohol. So here's the lens in the ciliary body. So now we're looking at the lens, which is the disc, the flexible disc that's um, behind the pupil inside the eye. You have these ciliary muscles of the ciliary body that are attached to the lens via these suspensory ligaments. And the ciliary muscles can contract or relax to kind of pull or put tension on the lens to make it kind of more bulged out or more flat. The iris is made up of two layers of smooth muscles, circular smooth muscles, which will help to constrict the pupil and radial smooth muscles, which will help to dilate the pupil in bright light or in dim light. The nervous tunic is the innermost layer of the eye. This is your retina that covers the posterior five, six. It contains two layers. The pigmented retina is the outer layer that keeps light from reflecting back into the eye. And then the sensory retina is what contains the photoreceptors. And this is one of the test questions about photoreceptors. These are rods and cones. They contain interneurons. And photoreceptors, these are sensitive to light. So these are your light sensory receptors that help you see. Rods specifically are more sensitive to light and you have, more, you have many more rods um, in your retina in relationship or in relation to cones. So your rods are about 20 times more prevalent than your cones and they can function in dim light. So your rods are what will help you see in dim light. And the cones are the photoreceptors that provide color vision. And you have three types of cones, blue, green, and red. And if someone who is colorblind will have a deficiency or one of their cones, based on which cone it is, will be deficient for blue, green, or red. So here's what a retinal rod looks like. Um, the outer segment looks has kind of this rod-like shape in the disc. And again, these are photoreceptors. So you'll have nuclei, axons, synaptic endings. These will be um, sensitive or be able to respond to light sensation. And then this should say cone at the top. Sorry about that, that is a mistake. So these are the retinal cones and they're cones because their disc or the top looks more like cone shaped. And you can see the axons, the nuclei and your cones are the photoreceptors that help you see color. There's other pigments and pigment proteins in your retina. Rhodopsin is the photosensitive pigment in your rod cells. Opsin is the colorless protein in rhodopsin and retinol is the yellow pigment in rhodopsin that requires vitamin A. You won't be asked too many details about those on your test. Here are the effects of light on rhodopsin. Um, the light strikes your rod photo um, receptor cell. The retinal changes shape, opsin changes shape, Retinal actually dissociates from opsin, they separate, and this changes the rhodopsin shape that stimulates the response in the rod cell, which results in vision. The retinal detaches from the opsin and then ATP is required to reattach them back together. This just shows you kind of how light works with that rhodopsin pigment. You won't need to know those steps. But here it takes you through that if you're interested, the effects of light on the rhodopsin pigment um, here we have the opsin and retinal light coming in. Um, they'll eventually detach from this um, structure here and ATP is required for it to do this. Again, you don't need to know these steps. The retina then, so rods and cones will synapse or kind of move along their sensory stimulation with bipolar cells of the sensory retina. Horizontal cells of the retina modify the output of the rods and cones and bipolar and horizontal cells will synapse with ganglion cells and ganglion cells will converge to form the optic nerve. And I like to kind of just describe this by showing you this picture. So how our eyes pick up light or images we see, um, the direction of light first comes in. So 
this is the back of the eye up here. So I'm just going to put this is the back of the eye and you can see that um, you can see the choroid layer back there, which is the second layer. So what happens is light comes in and hits the back of the eye first and it hits those pigmented cells and then it travels back in the form of action potentials toward these nerve fibers to form the optic nerve. So light comes in, it hits the back of the eye and then action potentials travel up through these layer of cells. They go through the photoreceptor layer. So this layer is where your rods and cones will be. And then those action potentials travel through the interneurons where you might see horizontal cells, bipolar cells, which will synapse with ganglion cells, which will then form fibers to form the optic nerve. And the optic nerve then is what travels out of the back of the eye to bring those action potentials from those images up to your brain for interpretation. In the retina, we have the macula, which is a small spot near the center of the retina. Within the macula is a part called the fovea centralis, where light will always be focused when looking directly at an object. In the fovea centralis, we have only cones. So this gives our eyes the ability to discriminate very fine images. And your eyes are constantly doing this. They're constantly focusing images so that they land on the fovea centralis where cones will help give them the finest or most acute vision. So even right now, looking at your screen or your phone or a book, um, your eyes are constantly kind of adjusting so that the image that's coming in is being focused um, on this fovea centralis. The optic disc, this is a test question, is called your blind spot. So within the back of each eye, we have blind spots. This is a white spot medial to the macula, and this is where your blood vessels enter the eye and spread over the retina. This is also where your axons exit as the optic nerve. And because you have blood vessels and axons entering and exiting the eye at this point, you don't have any photoreceptors. So if an image gets focused on this part of the eye, it'll kind of, it'll kind of go away from your vision. You won't see it anymore. So let's look at the retina. So here's a common picture that your optometrist um, would take as they're making sure that your retina is healthy and it's not detached. And you can see here is the um, macula, which is the area lateral to the optic disc. It contains the macula and within it is kind of the size of a pin is the fovea centralis where you have the greatest concentration of cones to help you see most um, acutely or strongest vision. And then medial to the macula is the optic disc. Um, and the optic disc is the area where you'll see all the vessels entering and you'll see all the axons exiting. So you can test your eyes for their blind spot. If you look at this picture and you cover up your right eye and focus on the plus sign and then go closer and further away from the screen, um, eventually the um, red spot will disappear from your, your peripheral vision because that image coming into the eye is being focused on the blind spot. And you can try that later. You can Google blind spot test and it'll describe to you how to do this test and you'll see um, an image like that to test for your blind spot. So here are the chambers of the eye. You have an anterior and a posterior chamber. Um, again, they are both um, located in front of the lens. So the anterior chamber is located between the cornea and the lens. It's filled with aqueous humor, um, which is more watery. And this aqueous humor maintains pressure, refracts light. Whenever you see the word refract, that means to bend and provides nutrients to the inner surface of the eye. Posterior chamber is located just behind the anterior chamber and it also contains aqueous humor. The vitreous chamber is located in the retinal region. So behind the lens, it contains vitreous humor, which is a jelly-like substance to help maintain pressure, hold the lens and retina in place, and also to refract light. So here's the functions of the eye. It works like a camera. The iris allows light into the eye, which is focused by the cornea, the lens, and the humors, the liquids, onto the retina. Your light, the light striking the retina produces action potentials that are relayed to the brain. And then light refraction and image focusing are two important processes in establishing vision. 
Light refraction is bending light and it bends things onto what we call the focal point, which is the point where the light rays will converge. It occurs anterior to the retina so that the light rays will converge and then we will invert the object onto the retina. So all of the images that um, you guys are seeing and taking in with your eyes are actually the retina sees them as a backwards and an inverted object. So um, backwards and upside down means inverted. But you guys see things as upright because that is what your brain, your brain then puts images back to upright or the normal way. Um, focusing images on the retina, we talk about accommodation where the lens becomes less rounded and the image can be focused on the retina. And this enables the eye to focus on images closer than 20 feet. So this allows you to see things close up. And many times in the elderly, they use the ability uh, to accommodate where it's harder for their lens to become less round. Um, so in the elderly, or even maybe 50, you might have to start wearing reading glasses to help with accommodation. So this kind of takes you through in, you know, what your lens is doing in distant and near vision. So in distant vision, the ciliary muscles in the ciliary body are relaxed, which is causing the tension in your suspensory ligaments to remain high. So we get a nice kind of flat lens. So if we flatten the lens, that helps us see things distant vision. Um, so you can see a far off tree and you can see how the image is backwards on the retina. In near vision, the ciliary muscles in the ciliary body contract, moving the ciliary body towards the lens. And this um, gives kind of less tension on the suspensory ligaments. So our lens becomes thickened or it bulges and that allows us to see things close up. And this bulging of the lens um, to see things close up is called accommodation. And again, you know, when you get older, your lens uses, loses the ability um, and your ciliary muscles use, lose the ability to contract, to bulge out the lens. So it's harder to read things um, close up. Neural pathway for vision. Again, these pathways you don't really need to know, but if you're curious, the optic nerve is what leaves the eye and exits the orbit through the optic foramen to enter your cranial cavity. The optic nerves will actually connect each other and cross over in a part called the optic chasm. And then the optic tracks will be the route or um, the way that the ganglion axons will travel. So here we have the optic nerves going one to each eye and they will cross over or connect each other at this place called the optic chasm and then continue on as the optic tracks into the appropriate part of the brain. So here's visual pathway. What this is describing, this is describing that left and right fields of each eye. Each eye will take in left and right images and those images will go to opposite parts of the brain. So you can see here which part of the eye field will travel to which part of the brain. So the left vision field will go to the left part of the brain, but the right vision field of the left eye goes to the right vision brain. So it's kind of confusing, but this just shows you how each eye has kind of right and left fields of vision. And the middle, the nasal parts of the visual field will make up the binocular vision, which is what both your eyes will focus on. And then right and left mono, monocular vision will be just what one side focuses on. So this is what helps you give, get very wide peripheral vision um, because your right and left eyes can really see far out into the periphery. And this is the pathway that travels um, up to the brain. You can see where they cross um, in the binocular vision. So the binocular vision will go to the opposite sides of the eye. Um, but then the other sides will go to the same sides of the brain. You don't need to know that, but it's just interesting to see how the vision travels to different parts of the brain. We have visual defects, my, myopia or myopia is nearsightedness. And um, if you get confused what nearsightedness means, this is what most of us need classes for. So if you can't see the board in fifth grade, you went home, told your mom you got classes like me in fifth grade. So that's nearsightedness when you can only see things near um, and it's harder for you to see things far away. And we call that myopia and that's the most common. This is where the image is focused in front of the retina. Hyperopia is farsightedness. So this means 
it's opposite. You can't see, you can see things far, but you can't see things near or close up. And the image is focused behind the retina. Presbyopia is when the lens becomes less elastic. And usually reading glasses are required because it's harder um, to do the accommodation of reading things close up. Astigmat astigmatism also affects um, usually teens. It starts to affect teenagers. This gives um, the lens an irregular curvature and usually glasses or contacts are required to correct. If you look, if you were wondering if you have astigmatism, look at uh, an old fashioned clock with all the numbers and see if all the numbers look um, blurry. Usually, if you're looking at astigmatism, some of the numbers on the periphery of a circle or lines going out to the numbers, some of them will, will look blurry or they won't have all the same boldness. Color blindness is the absence or deficiency of one or more of those colors of cones. And this is primarily affects males. Glaucoma is increased pressure in the eye and it can also lead to blindness. This is a chart to determine color blindness. And um, if you know you're colorblind or if you don't, hopefully you can see these letters. And if not, it's okay. Um, we'll see if you guys can read the numbers in each kind of circle. And what this tests for is different types of color blindness. So there, there's different types of color blindness, blue, green, and red cones. So they're testing to see if um, what type of your cone you might be deficient in. So hopefully you see the number five on the right and the number 74 on the left. And if you don't, you might be colorblind for one type of the cone. And many times colorblindness might make some of the colors just a little bit duller. Um, so you'll still be able to see color, but they might not be as um, vibrant because you'll be deficient in one of those colors of cones. So then we get to the ear. Um, the organ of hearing and the organs of hearing and balance are both located in the ears. Each ear is divided into three areas, the external, middle, and inner ear working our way in. The external ear extends from the outside of the head to the eardrum. We have the oracle, which is the fleshy part that can bend, which we all have different shapes of. The external auditory meatus is the canal that leads to the eardrum that um, we all stick Q-tips in, but we actually aren't supposed to because not many centimeters down, we have our eardrum, the tympanic membrane. And we never want to break that or um, cause that to burst or cause a hole in it. The tympanic membrane is the thin membrane that separates the external and the middle ear. The middle ear is filled with air. So that's important to note. So your middle ear is only filled with air, but we get these three tiny ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Three, these three tiny ear bones are so tiny, and I don't have one with me, that they would all fit on the head of a penny. They're so tiny. The malleus looks like a hammer. It's attached to the tympanic membrane. The incus is the anvil that's in the middle. And the stapes looks like a stirrup that you would stick your foot in of a saddle. And it's located at the base of the oval window. The oval window then is kind of the separation between the middle and the inner ear. And coming out of the middle ear, we have the eustachian or the auditory tube. It opens into the pharynx or the throat, and it helps to equalize air pressure between the outside air and the middle ear. This will be what helps to equalize pressure. Um, if you're in the mountains or on an, in an airplane, you hear that popping noise. That popping is actually your tympanic membrane popping back into place as this tube helps to equalize air pressure. The inner ear is then filled with fluid. So these are your fluid filled chambers. You have a bony labyrinth and a membranous lab labyrinth. Um, bony labyrinth are the tunnels filled with fluid. There's three regions. We have the cochlea, vestibule, semicircular canals, and the membranous labyrinth is the inside bony labyrinth filled with a specific type of fluid called the endolymph. The endolymph is a clear fluid and the perilymph is a fluid between the membranous and the bony labyrinth. And then cochlea, this is the test question you guys need to know. This is where hearing takes place. It looks like a snail. If this is damaged, can this cause deafness while exerting or lifting weights? Like your eardrum, if there's so much pressure build up, like your, your tympanic membrane would like pop. I don't know if I've heard, I've never heard of that deafness caused by so much pressure build up. Yeah, if you're lifting weights, there's so much pressure. That's why you always want to breathe. Lifting weights or exerting a lot of pressure can also cause hernias. So breathing while you're weightlifting is very important. 
Um, that's interesting. So Kim, you've heard of that too. Deafness caused while exerting or lifting weights. I, I haven't heard about it that, but I believe it. You should probably see a doctor, Matt. That might be good. Yeah, go to a doctor, breathe. Don't become deaf with lifting weights or don't lift as many. Take care of your bodies, guys. You only get one of them. Um, I, that's interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. I haven't heard of that, but I believe it because yeah, when you're lifting weights, you're, yeah, all the pressure build up. There is a pressure, it goes to your ears. It cause, it could cause, I would assume, something to pop out of place. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate your comments. Makes class more interesting for me. Okay, and then the inner ear, inner ear is made up of kind of chambers or tubes called the scala vestibuli, scala tympia, and the cochlea duct. And these all three chambers are located in the cochlea that I'll show you a picture of. The spiral organ is in the cochlea or duct. It contains your hair cells, which help with hearing. The tectorial membrane is what the hair cells will vibrate against to produce action potentials. And these hair cells themselves are attached to sensory neurons. And when they bend, they are what will produce action potentials to help with hearing. These hair cells, um, and eventually we'll talk about it, these hair cells are located in the fluid. And basically what hearing is doing is it's producing vibrations that travel through the fluid in your cochlea. And these vibrations that make like waves then in these fluid filled kind of spaces in the cochlea, those waves caused from vibrations are what will bend the hair cells and the bending of those hair cells is what creates action potentials um, to cause hearing. You have different membranes that are walls that separate out these chambers. And eventually I'm just gonna show you a picture because that might help explain it better. Here are the structures of the ear, external, middle, and inner ear. Again, the external and middle ear are both only filled with air. And then the inner ear is what is filled with fluid. So what's happening is sound waves. So anything you hear, like my, my voice, for example, creates waves in the air. And those waves enter in the tympanic membrane. Those waves will vibrate against the tympanic membrane. And then those vibrations are amplified about 10 to 100 fold through these teeny tiny ossicle bones. So these bones vibrate and the stapes, um, which looks like a stirrup, it will vibrate against the oval window and the vibrations against the oval window cause those vibrations from the sound waves to turn into like waves in the ocean that travel through all this liquid, kind of liquid filled kind of compartment of the inner ear. We have semicircular canals, um, we have the vestibule, and then we have the cochlea, which is actually is where hearing takes place. It looks like a snail shell. And you'll see here another cranial nerve, the vestibulocochlear nerve branches into a cochlear branch and a vestibule branch. Um, and that's what takes up the action potentials from the bending of those hair waves or those hairs due to those kind of vibration waves through the fluid. And that's how um, we hear. A little more structures of the cochlea. So um, we've kind of taken cross sections of the cochlea here. So you have the cochlea and what we're gonna focus in on is the tube of the cochlea and we've zoomed in on it here. And this cochlea has different chambers. The scala vestibuli is on top, it's right here. Scala tympani is below it. We have the cochlear duct. Um, and then now we're going to zoom in on the cochlear duct. And that's what we're looking at here because within the cochlear duct, within the cochlea is where we have the spiral organ. And this is kind of the spiral organ, which are the supporting cells and the hair cells. Again, what's happening here is these hair cells will be what bend due to those wave vibrations. And the bending of those hair cells is picked up by um, cochlear nerve axons shown in yellow. And that's how we hear. So here's the hearing process. Again, I don't know if you're asked about the hearing process on your test. I kind of described it already. Sound travels in waves through the air, funneled by the oracle. Um, it hits the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum. It'll vibrate. Sound is greatly amplified by those three tiny bones, which transmit sound to the oval window. 
And then the oval window produces waves in the perilymph or the liquid of the cochlea. Vibrations in the perilymph cause the vestibular membrane in the endolymph to vibrate. It displaces itself on another membrane. Um, basically, the movement of these membranes are what is detected by those hairs in the spiral organ, hair cells, not hair hairs, and the hair cells become bent and cause action potentials to be created. And this is the effect of sound waves on the middle and inner ear. You can see sound waves traveling in one, two, three, through the external and inner ear, and then four, we're traveling through um, these chambers of the cochlea. And as we're doing that, the sound waves are causing the bending of those hair cells. What happens when these sound waves are done? Well, they actually kind of exit out or they finish their vibration pattern or travel at the round window. And the round window is also connected to the middle ear. This is again, the auditory tube where um, we help to equalize all pressure. Then we'll get to equilibrium and balance, which our ears are really important for. Static equilibrium is associated with the vestibule, the other part of the inner ear kind of piece. It evaluates your position, uh, the position of your head relative to gravity. And dynamic equilibrium is associated with these semicircular canals. And this evaluates changes in direction and the rate of head movement. The vestibule is a part of the inner ear. It contains the utricle and saccule. The maculae are specialized patches of epithelium um, that are surrounded by that liquid that contain hair cells. And otoliths are a gelatinous substance that moves in response to gravity, and they will be attached to hair cell microvilli, which initiate action potentials. So here's a look at location structure of the maculae um, located in the vestibule, the utricle and saccula. Basically, we get hair cells that are kind of, kind of within this gelatinous mass called otoliths. And it's kind of fun to see what those look like in real life. Um, so this gelatinous mass, the hair cells will bend when you're kind of doing a kind of a figure skating turn. Um, so we're spinning around really quickly and the bending of those hair cells helps to detect balance or keep your body upright. Here's the function of the vestibule in maintaining balance with the force of gravity looking down. Um, the bending of those hair cells causes your body to maintain itself even when looking down for gravity. Um, balance has to do with semicircular canals, the dynamic equilibrium, so the spinning, and they will be able to sense movement in any direction. We have the ampulla, which is the base of them. The crista ampullaris is within them, and the cupula, cupula is the gelatinous mass that's able to float and displaced by endolymph movement. So here's kind of what your semicircular canals look like um, and how the hair cells are kind of embedded within this cupula, the gelatinous mass, which will again bend when spinning around. Earwax is very important. Um, earwax is created in the external ear. Um, what is, why is, what is ear, earwax important for? What do you guys think? It's very important and you should probably leave it in your ears um, unless you're producing a ton of it and it's really gross. Earwax is very important, helps to collect dust. It's basically just a defense mechanism for anything harmful. I mean, think of bugs, insects, bacteria, every, anything might be trapped in that earwax so it doesn't get through um, or into the middle ear. You know, in terms of how earwax is formed, um, I'm not sure, but it's formed in the external ear. You'll have cells creating that earwax in the external ear. So this is a look at the function of the crista ampullaris, the endolymph of doing, let's say you're jumping off a balance beam backward. The endolymph will cause movement of the cupula, so it'll move that, and that sensation of your head or your body spinning will be picked up so that your body can kind of then compensate for that. Not a whole lot of questions about balance on your test either. And that's it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and end or stop the recording. Um.